On December 7, 1941, Japanese forces attacked Pearl Harbor, and that changed the landscape of the world. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the president at that time, announced that the United States was entering into this global conflict called World War II. And the spark that lit the fire was this attack on Pearl Harbor. In a speech to the American people, President Roosevelt declared December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. That was a day that changed the world. Oh, other days in world history live in infamy, and other days live famously for what they've done. You imagine, especially in days like today, the, the day that the uh, smallpox vaccine was discovered. That was a day that changed the world. Or the day that the printing press was discovered. That was a day that changed the world. Other days, like September 11th, are days that spark in our hearts a deep sorrow, but those days changed the world as well. There are days that you've experienced, days in your life that have changed the landscape of your life, days of deep sorrow or deep joy. Days of great pain or days of great triumph. These are days that have changed the landscape of your world. But there is one day. There is one singular day that rises above all others. There is a day that changed everything and in which everything changed. It, it didn't change it just for a moment. It didn't change the world for a season or for a lifetime or even for a generation. There is a day, the day that we celebrate this day, there is a day that changes everything for all eternity. Now remember again, what the angel said to Mary and Mary and Salome as they came to anoint the body of Jesus. You see, the cross killed Jesus, and all followers of Christ were living in the hopelessness and the despair, the fear and the struggle of that death. Their world was over. What they knew was gone. And so as these ladies approached the tomb, they expected to be tending to a dead body. After all, that's what you expect to find in a graveyard. Dead people stay dead. A day that will live in infamy. But God in his great grace reversed that great terrible day of Christ's crucifixion, and he brought something new. Look at verse 6. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. This is the day that has changed every day, and that is what we celebrate Today, death is defeated, sin is destroyed, life is delivered. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead changes everything. And on this day that we celebrate, everything is changed. The women came to the tomb expecting to tend a dead body. But on this day, the day that celebrates Christ's resurrection, this was the day that changes the world. The resurrection of Jesus Christ promises victory, a great reversal to all 
who belong to him. I know that many of you are struggling with life and struggling with this season of life, but please understand that what we celebrate here and now changes the landscape of our world. What we celebrate now changes the viewpoint of our life. And if you and I are followers of Jesus, then we have a different way of looking at life and death, of disease, of health. We have a different way, a different view of looking at everything. This is the day that changes everything for us because this is the day that God gives us in which faith overpowers fear. I, I love to drive in the mountains. It's one of the uh, things. That I love to go fishing in the mountains, but I love to drive in the mountains. And I love to get in my car and, and drive zip and zip uh, uh, along those mountain roads. There are different sections that I enjoy most. Uh, but even as I'm driving along those mountain roads, my wife, Edie, and my daughters, they don't enjoy it nearly as much as I do if they're passengers in the car with me. As we're driving along these mountain roads, they, they, they begin to get anxious and fearful. You can imagine uh, what that would look like. Uh, they, they, they begin to imagine the worst around every hairpin turn. And especially as the day gets darker and the road gets narrower, I can uh, just hear them in my ears saying, and eventually they do, Dad or Eric, slow down. And in my manly bravado, I respond, sometimes with a huff and a puff, I've got this. I, I believe that the way my wife and children feel when I'm driving mountain roads is the way these women felt and all the followers of Jesus felt as, as, as they approached the death of Jesus. And they were filled with fear over uncertainties of today and tomorrow, over the grief that death brings. And they were struggling. And the angel said to them, don't be alarmed. Don't be afraid. And as they listened to the rest of the message, and as they saw eventually the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, that picture of fear began to fade in the backdrop of their faith in the God who raises Jesus from the dead. The resurrection changed everything. Their fears were crying out, slow down. But God, through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, declares, I've got this. Faith overcomes fear. Now, you see this most profoundly in the person of Peter, that disciple who was a bold follower of Jesus during Christ's earthly ministry. You hear him say in, in, in Mark chapter 8 that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and, and that he would follow Jesus to the death. Uh, but then, uh, then the cross came into view, and Peter was nowhere to be found. And Jesus is arrested and taken before the Sanhedrin and before Pilate, and Peter is running and hiding in the shadows, denying that he ever knew Jesus. Fear had overcome his following Jesus. And now Jesus is dead. But if you look at verse 7, Jesus wants to send a message to Peter and the other disciples, but especially Peter. He said, go to Galilee and I'll meet you there. In John chapter 21, we get a picture of Jesus meeting with Peter. And the resurrected Jesus gives faith to Peter that overpowers his fear. From that point forward, we see Peter stepping out in faith, leading the charge of declaring the good news of God's rescuing love found in the person of Jesus. And three decades later, he's about to be killed. He's been persecuted. 
He's, he's been uh, beaten and, and, and imprisoned, and even as he pens a letter to a church, the prospect of his death is looming before him. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, we hear Peter writing to the church with the words of faith that have overpowered all of his fears. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, Peter declares, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The resurrection awakened faith in Peter and in Christ's followers so that they could live beyond their fears, where their fears cried out, slow down. Their faith screamed even louder, God's got this. Today, I want to encourage you to awaken your faith. Awaken your faith so that your fears might be overpowered. Awaken your faith by praising the Lord. Maybe in your gathering right now, as you're gathered with others, just stop a moment and say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Blessed, blessed, blessed be the God who has loved us so greatly. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything for you and for me and for the world because it gives us faith that overpowers our fear. It changes everything because it gives us forgiveness that conquers our sin. Sin is fun for a season. Uh, We all know that. Uh, and, And for us to say anything different about sin is simply untrue. All of us have sinned because it feeds some yearning in our soul, uh, a yearning that can only rightly be fulfilled by relationship with God, but we chase down these different pathways looking for different pleasures that sin affords. And so we chase after sin, but sin always carries with it a consequence, It's like uh, as you've gathered, maybe you're eating uh, waffles this morning in your room as you're uh, worshiping the Lord today. Maybe you're uh, you're feasting on your second helping of Cheerios, or, or 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 you're looking forward to a grand Easter lunch or dinner. And and by the time this day is over, you have feasted and you have feasted and you have feasted so much that you're sitting miserable in the chair. Uh, the Bible tells us that gluttony is a sin, just like being a drunk is. But, but as we look at that pursuit of food and, and realize that if you take too much of it, it's going to lead you to misery, make no mistake, any tasting of the tidbit morsels of sin will lead to disaster. Sin kills, but Jesus died to kill our sin. Again, look in Mark chapter 16, verse 6. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which is a picture of Jesus, this this historical Jesus who grew up in Nazareth and, and whom these ladies had followed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. And then he adds this phrase, who was crucified? Oh, why did, uh, why did uh, John Mark add that statement? Everybody knew that Jesus was killed. Why would he add that here? Well, I think that it's important for us to understand the message from God through the messenger of God is that, yes, Jesus was crucified. And, and the tense of that verb, the, the, the verbal tense, tells us that this is a death that happened in the past, three days ago, but it has consequences that result for eternity. The crucifixion of Jesus was a death that happened uh, uh, on a cross a few days before this uh, visit to the tomb. But the consequence of his death has eternal results, and those are the results that we celebrate if indeed we're followers of Christ. This death of Jesus on a cross 
brings about a forgiveness of sin that we could never gain on our own. Sin brings the consequence of shame. It brings the the consequence of guilt. It brings a, a, a disharmony in our soul, but ultimately it separates us from God. And that separation from God is a chasm too far for us to cross. But Jesus came to kill our sin and give us forgiveness. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon said it this way, our sins are gone. Jesus cast them into his own tomb and they are buried there, never to have a resurrection. Yes, our sin separates us from God, but Jesus came as the substitute for us. He died on the cross in our place to provide forgiveness for our sin. Romans chapter 4 verse 25 tells us that Jesus died to bring us forgiveness for our sin and then he was raised from the dead to justify us, to make us right in the sight of God. If indeed you're a follower of Christ and you've had faith overwhelm your fear and you have embraced Jesus as Savior and King, then make no mistake, you have a forgiveness that has conquered your sin once and for all. And with Peter, we declare, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. He's given us new life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. In Christ, my history doesn't define me, and it doesn't determine my destiny, but in Christ, his death gives me a forgiveness that no one can take away, and his resurrection gives me a new life that, that leads me to eternity. This is a day, this day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. It changes everything because it gives us a fear that overpower, a faith that overpowers fear. It gives us forgiveness that conquers death, and it gives us hope that defeats despair. Death is a hopeless thing, and I hate it. When death hits home, it's devastating. When we are confronted by the dark shadows of death, especially with someone that we love, it can fill us with such a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Death is a hopeless thing. Aristotle said that death is a dreadful thing for it is the end. Mahatma Gandhi said, my days are numbered. I'm not likely to live very long, perhaps a year and a little more. And for the first time in 50 years, I find myself in the pit of hopelessness. All about me is darkness, and I'm praying for light. Death is a hopeless thing. And when everything seems lost and joy is in the tomb, friends, God steps in and he gives us a resurrection. He is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. And because God has conquered death through the person of Jesus Christ, we have hope that defeats all despair. Because Jesus lives, we have a hope in which the terrors of the night are defeated by the light of God's rescuing love. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is according to God's abundant mercy, his steadfast love, his never failing, always abounding, always faithful love. God's love gives us 
a new beginning. By his love, we are begotten again. We have a new birth. We have a new life. All of us long to have a love that will change our lives. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ delivers that kind of love. It is a love that gives us a brand new beginning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, the apostle Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And all these things are from God who has reconciled us to himself. Oh, friends, you want a new beginning. It, it happens because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God's love gives us a new beginning through Christ's resurrection. God's love gives us a security in life that will never fade away. All of us long to be safe and secure, free from the terror of uncertain todays and tomorrows. And the truth that God unveils for us here and now, the truth that he unleashes with his glory at the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that we have an eternity of security in the presence of God. We have, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, a security that changes our lives so completely that we have a constant view of triumph and victory. For friends, if God can raise Jesus from the dead, he can conquer all things. And if I belong to Jesus, then the promise that God makes is that what he has done for Jesus, he will continue to do for you and me, not just at the end of time, but every day that we live. We are secure in the grip of God's rescuing love that gives us a living hope for today and a living hope for tomorrow. Because he lives, we have a living hope. We have a new beginning, a new birth, a new life. What God has done for Jesus, he will do and continue to do for all who belong to Jesus. Because Jesus lives, we have powerful protection. Regardless of the night at nightmarish moments that we may face, God is with us, securing us in the grip of his grace and in the power of his love. God guards us on our journey from here to eternity. Oh, friends, because Jesus died on a cross for us, we can be forgiven for our sin. And the fears that once conquered our soul have been conquered by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Because he died, I'm forgiven. Because he lives, I can live in hope every single day. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. How can you and I take hold of this wondrous hope? How can we live empowered by the day, this day that changes everything, free from the power of fear, for now we have a faith that overpowers fear. We have forgiveness that conquers sin. We have hope that defeats despair. How can we taste that in everyday life? It can only happen through relationship. And I've used this picture before. If one of my daughters comes to me and says, uh, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and they call me or text me, or they come busting up in my room, and they say, Daddy, quick, help. I need help. I jump up from my bed, no matter what time it is, and I will run to help them. But friends, if you come up in my house at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you say, Daddy, I need help, I'm calling the police. Proximity to me does not give me access, give you access to my help, but relationship with me gives access to help. The same thing is true with God. We, 
we might uh, attend worship gatherings like this in person or online, but friends, just sitting in a room and listening to songs and, and a sermon on the resurrection does not give us the new life that he offers. Proximity doesn't give us access to hope. Relationship gives us access to hope. And for us to experience this day so that it changes everything about our now and our yesterday and our tomorrow, we must have relationship with God. So how can we find this relationship with God? The Bible tells us that as many as received Jesus, to as many as believed on his name, to them he gave the right to be called the sons and daughters of God. What brings us into the family of God is when we, by faith, trust Jesus. If we want a relationship with God, we need to place our trust in Jesus. Trust that what he did on the cross was sufficient payment for our sin. That we place our trust in Jesus knowing that he is the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, who died for my sin in my place on a cross and who was raised from the dead to give me new life. We need to believe on Jesus. And we need to believe on Jesus in such a way that we turn away from that independent life, that life apart from God, that life that is uh, not looking toward God and not submitted to God. But in placing our faith in Jesus, we turn away from that old life and we turn toward Jesus. We surrender all that we are to God. We give him our lives, our emotion, our will. We submit to him as our God. Today, we celebrate the day that changes everything. But has it changed your life? Have you experienced the power of the resurrection alive in you so that faith overpowers fear, so that forgiveness conquers your sin, and so that hope defeats despair? If you have not yet received that wondrous gift of God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, I invite you to cry out to God in faith today. And we come into a relationship with God when we place our faith in Jesus and we turn from our sin and we trust in him. The Bible says that if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we can be saved. We can be rescued if we call upon the name of Jesus. In faith, we can enter into God's family. And if that's the desire of your heart, I invite you even now, even with people around you, Everybody in the different rooms, if you'll just bow your heads right now. And I invite you, if this is your heart's desire to become a follower of Jesus Christ, I invite you right now to pray a prayer of faith. There's nothing magical about these words. What leads us to put our faith in Jesus and turn to, uh, away from our sin and trust in him is what the Spirit of God is doing in your heart right now. He's awakened in you a faith to believe. And he's leading you and drawing you to say yes to Jesus in this moment. And you respond to that work of God by his Spirit in your life by talking to God. And that's what this prayer does. And if that's your heart's desire, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. Oh God, I acknowledge that I am a sinner and my sin has separated me from you. Today, I acknowledge that Jesus is your son, that you sent him to die on a cross in my place and for my sin, and that 
you raised him from the dead so that I might be made right in your eyes. So God, right now, I pray that you would, based upon what Jesus has done, that you would forgive my sin forever and that you would give me a new heart and a new life. I pray, oh God, that you would save me because of my faith in Jesus. I turn right now from my old life of independence and a lack of submission to you, and I turn in trust of Jesus. And I give you all that I am. Thank you, O God, for rescuing me. Thank you for bringing me into your family. If that was the cry of your heart and the prayer that you prayed, I want to invite you to text Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, to the number on the screen, or you can email pastor at firstnorfolk.org and let us know that you have made this commitment and we will share with you some of the next steps as a follower of Jesus. Uh, we want to encourage you in this commitment. We want to help you in your life as a follower of Christ, this life of victory and hope. As we close today, I want to thank you for gathering with us. I want us to set our focus on Jesus in these closing moments. Let's celebrate all that he's done for us. Let's sing our praise to him who has given us life.